again. Yeah. So this is one of two wet lab spaces that Mo has. Um, and it houses these things right here. You guys remember what these tanks are called? Raceways, that's right. Um, they're up here, and you'll see the majority of them actually downstairs where most growing and most coral. Um, this particular lab is kept open for visiting scientists. So while this facility is focused on coral restoration, they also have other scientists from uh, all over the world come in, observe, and do their own experiments. So they keep a space open for collaboration, which is always cool. Um, so this is Probably uh, okay, so I told you guys about the uh, microfragmentation process, the little circles that we glue onto the cement plugs. Well, you can see them right here. And this is one of the Moog employees cleaning off the algae that grows on anything that you're, um, anything when you're dealing with ocean water. It's going to be everywhere. Can you do a few lessons, so it's fun. Um, but yeah. You can see they have them on these little racks. They have numbers on them. And they're organized by um, genotype and species. I imagine those numbers are probably genotype, and I bet that the species, although maybe, I'm not, I'm not gonna get over my head, but they're organized very well. <laughs> um, you can see that there's actually a lot of little critters living alongside of the corals. So they have some snails in there. They got some crabs in here. Why do you think they have other animals living alongside the coral? Why? What? Maybe. Maybe. Snails specifically, what do you think snails could do to help the coral? What? That? that is exactly right. They're going to eat some of that algae that would naturally compete with the coral. So, very nice. Um, that's one more. Uh, okay, so, um, who wants to know about coral reproduction? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. Okay, so, um, corals don't reproduce like most of them. They have a mass spawning event. So this happens once a year on a full moon, sometime in August. Only once a year. And they do it all at the same time. Every species, every coral, every single individual. We don't know how they all know to do it at the exact same time. But we have a couple guesses why. Why do you think they would want to release all the eggs, and all the sperm, all that genetic material all at the same time? Yeah, so um, here's a fun fact for you. So they release the bundles of sperm and eggs into the water, they float through the water, and they only fertilize one out of one million. Okay? So one out of one million, an egg and a sperm meet and actually drop to the bottom and become a successful coral column. So if they were to release them sporadically throughout the year, they would have to rely on other individuals. Question? Um, it's not a response. It's not like a you go to and do a thing. I remember that it's not a thing. Oh, I, I can't really hear you right now? It's like a few of things. It's not like a thing. Oh. Yes. Yeah. It's, sure. it's yeah. From Aldenheim, yes. Yeah. So like I was saying, if they staggered when they released those gametes, it would be a lot harder for them to meet up. Also, if you release them all at the same time, um, it's thought that that might be a method of overwhelming predators that would prey on all that, basically free carbon in the water. So fish can only eat so much, so during these mass spawning events, they eat as much as they can, and then they get tired, just like we do, have to eat a lot, and then they go to sleep. And then the four old gametes that are left, they fuse together, and that's how the magic happens. Um, the boat actually will go out during these spawning events at night, and they'll scoop some of those gametes up by gametes, you know what I mean? Eggs and sperm. Catwood. 
itself. High school biology. Uh, so we'll take those eggs and those sperm. They'll so bring them back here, actually in that room over there, and they will individually fertilize them to promote that recombination, to promote that sexual reproduction. So why do you think they would want to promote sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual reproduction? <laughs> Any guesses from the quiet people in the crowd? Oh, oh he's got a guess. Yeah, exactly. That's evolution, right? Evolution happens through sexual reproduction. That's how uh, art uh, oh, not artificial, but natural selection. That's how natural selection happens. So when sexual reproduction happens, genes get scrambled up, and there's always a chance that a new combination will be better than the combination of their parents. Um, that's why I'm taller than my dad. No. Uh, <laughs> no, that's he's Lamarckian. A, yeah, he's a very, very smart man. I hope to be like him someday. Uh, anyway, so plurals, as you know by this time of the week, are not doing so well out there. So if we can get them to basically sexually reproduce enough and we can accelerate that process, maybe there's a chance that nature will come up with a hardier genotype of uh, coral that can withstand hotter, more acidic, um, more pollutant-filled water. It's a gamble, but it's a gamble worth, uh, worth taking. Um, one last thing, now that there are less coral out on the reef, do you think it is more or less likely that sperm and eggs will meet when they spawn? A lot less likely. So the fact that they're scooping them up and they're putting them in these tanks, uh, you know, it, it seems like a futile gesture, but at this point, it's crucial because they've reached a level that is what's uh, known as sexually extinct. So um, you've heard of this one. Uh, when they're describing like rhinos or cheetahs, right? There's not enough of them in the gene pool to um, create viable offspring. And a lot of them are inbred and it's hurting the population. Well, that's being applied to a lot of coral species now. So if we can sort of artificially grab that uh, reproductive engine, maybe we can have a chance at help, uh, helping to stabilize their population. All right, let's see. Some facts. Okay, so the process of rearing those gametes, see, you have to do water changes every two to three hours because they're very small and fragile. Does that make sense? Um, for the pillar coral, which is a particularly fragile species of coral, it forms these huge fuzzy towers that are really, really characteristic. I love them. We used to have one at Lou, and this year it died. Very sad. Uh, <laughs> that was depressing. Yeah. I'm gonna, that's going to be a theme this week. <laughs>